Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring psi and psychoanalysis. My guest is Dr. Richard Reichbart. He is a training and supervising psychoanalyst with a private practice in northern New Jersey. In addition, he is a short story writer, a parapsychologist, and a poet. He is the author of The Paranormal Surrounds Us, Psychic Phenomena in Literature, Culture, and Psychoanalysis. His book of fiction and poetry is titled Curious Stories of Diverse Places. He has also had a career as an attorney representing civil rights and Native American interests. In addition, he is the former president of the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Richard. It's a real pleasure to be with you on New Thinking Aloud. I've been reading your articles in the uh, Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research for decades. So, uh, I'm just delighted to have this time with you today. Jeff, it's, it's an absolute honor to be here. I, I'm delighted to be here, and I have been following your work for years, including your work on this site. So, uh, it's just, uh, I, I'm very grateful for this interview. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Richard. We're going to talk about psi and psychoanalysis. And it dawned on me that we, we may be living in an era where many of our viewers won't really know what psychoanalysis is. I, I know when I was an undergraduate in college, everybody was talking about Freud, but already even then he was sort of on his way out. The universities didn't like to teach Freud. I, I think this is, this is like, uh, the obituary notice of somebody's death saying where somebody is still alive. Uh, my experience of psychoanalysis, particularly uh, now in, in near New York City, where I presently live, uh, is that it is very much alive. But it, it is true that it is no longer as popular in the academic world as it once was. When I was an undergraduate, uh, I helped form the uh, Psychology Students Association at the University of Wisconsin. It was in 1969. Uh, we had a big student strike and had demands. And one of our demands for the psychology department was that they institute a course on Freud. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> It is true in, 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 in some parts of the country and in some programs, psychoanalysis is no longer as much in favor as it, what, what, as it once was. But the psychoanalytic community has actually in some ways expanded. It used to be that psychoanalysis was under the control of the medical profession, the MDs. Uh, and then as a result of, the, of, of a lawsuit, it, it, it uh, against the American Psychoanalytic Association and the International uh, Psychoanalytic Association, uh, the field was expanded uh, to include uh, other professions. And now you have many social workers and many psychologists and even people who do not begin with a mental health degree as psychoanalysts. You uh, pursued a very unusual career track. You started your career out as, as a lawyer, I think, doing uh, work with Native Americans here in New Mexico and switched over to uh, psychology and psychoanalysis. Well, it, I graduated from law school, from Yale Law School in 1968. At that time, it wasn't my intention to necessarily study uh, Native American law, or, or and, and and I knew nothing about the Nav Navajo and Hopi res reservations, but uh, uh, there was the Vietnam War on, and and I did not want to I did not want to serve uh, in, in the draft during the war, and my way of getting out of it was to get a a, a deferment uh, for working with the Navajo and Hopi Indians, a deferment which was actually granted to me with the help of uh, Sam Irvin, 
later of Watergate fame, Senator Irvin, who got a, a number of lawyers from Yale and Stanford and, and uh, uh, other places, uh, deferments to work on the Navajo and Hopi reservation and other reservations because he had been the principal spot sponsor of the Native American rights law, which in effect provided a bill of rights on the ne on the reservations, which previously did not exist. So we all went traipsing out to 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 distant places in order to be attorneys to rep to help the Navajos and Hopis and other tribes uh, institute that law. I gather it was at that time in your life as as a result of a uh, personal tragedy that uh, you sought. Uh, psychotherapy and got involved in, in, in psychoanalysis coincidentally with Jewel Eisenbud, one of the great parapsychologists. Toward the end of my my tenure at, at, on the Navajo and Hopi Reservation, I indeed needed uh, psychotherapy help. And for some reason, the local psychiatrist with whom I was working sent me, said, said you need psychoanalysis and sent me off from Albuquerque, where I think you are presently. Yes. Sent me off on my own to somebody called Jewel Eisenberg uh, to do something called psychoanalysis, which I kind of knew a little about, but very little. And I ended up on Jewel Eisenberg's doorstep in, in Denver uh, and began my psychoanalysis with him. I knew lo nothing about psychoanalysis. I knew even less about parapsychology when I started with him. <laughs> so, so it's really quite a journey you've been on, uh, going from being a lawyer, working with Native Americans, and r rising to a position of, of prominence. You were the president of one of the leading psychoanalytic training institutes in the country. Oh, that that's a wonderful way of it. Yes, that, that part is true. It, it has been quite a journey, which sometimes I look back upon and do not quite believe. Uh, I did not expect to be here. Not only uh, yeah, I'm, I'm president again of that, that institute, uh, which is interesting because despite all that, uh, you mentioned psycho psychoanalysis to this day does not embrace parapsychology. So even though I have risen to some degree of prominence in, in my in, in the psychoanalytic profession, my work in parapsychology is virtually ignored in that profession. <laughs> I think you learned to keep your head down. I think that's the phrase you used. And uh, not to suffer the same fate as Jewel Eisenbud, who was, uh, by all accounts, fr from my perspective, a great psychoanalyst. But when he uh, published his work with uh, Ted Sirios, the uh, bellhop from Chicago who uh, could create thought images uh, on Polaroid film, uh, Eisenbud became a uh, persona non grata within the psychoanalytic community. And I guess you resolved not to let that happen to you. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> That's exactly what I resolved. I, I, yes. And, and, and Eisenbud, I think, was, he, he always knew it was going to be a difficult battle, but I think he was very disappointed uh, uh, that he was, he became such a pers persona non Non grata. And to this day, his work with Ted Serios is completely ignored in, in, even though he writes that book, his, his book about Ted Serios from a psychoanalytic perspective is completely ignored by psychoanalysts. They might cite at times a little of his work in terms of parapsychology and psychoanalysis in doing treatment of patients. But his work with Ted Serios is is he he'd become a complete black sheep from from their point of view because of the work with Ted Serios, whom incidentally after my psychoanalysis with Jules Eisenberg, which was uh, somewhat brief in the world of psychoanalytic therapy, I did actually have occasion to have one session with my wife at the time and Ted Serios, uh, where Ted. Ted tried to continue to produce some of his uh, psychic photographs without success at that time. But uh, so I did have the occasion to actually meet Ted Sirius. Well, that uh, is remarkable. He was a legendary figure. Uh, 
certainly amongst uh, parapsychologists today, a very important person in the history of parapsychology. And Eisenbud not only went to great lengths to document his uh, psychic photography or thoughtography, uh, but Eisenbud also published a couple of books uh, relating psychoanalytic theory to things like telepathy and other forms of psychic functioning. There was early work done by Freudian-oriented uh, psychoanalysts that built upon Freud's own theories concerning parapsychology, which people have tended to ignore. But the early work done by these uh, Freudian psychologists, including Eisenbud and, and Ullman, and, uh, uh, has has been has also been very much ignored in the present. Although there are at present some psychoanalysts who do invoke parapsychology, they often do so, certainly ignoring Eisenbud and ignoring much of the early work, which which seems to me a, a, a shame. And in doing so. They've also ignored sometimes Eisenbud's theories that parapsychological functioning in people lends itself to all kinds of all kinds of psychological ways of working, including Eisenbud's theory that there was also an aggressive opponent to a component to psi, and that has not not gained much adherence presently. Unfortunately, because I think he was right. He was building on the theories of Tenhoff, who, who had ideas of the, the reason that people tend to ignore Psy is because they get frightened of the fact that maybe they're, if you have psychological functioning, not only telepathy, but uh, a psychokinesis, and it has an aggressive component to it, that it gets rather frightening, like, like horror films. So people tend to ignore Psy as a result of, of, of those thoughts. Freud himself tended to ignore that aspect of things. But Eisenbach did embrace that idea. I think that has added to the tendency it is to, to ignore his work. Well, it seems to me that one of the hallmarks of Freudian theory is, is the idea of defense mechanisms that we want to protect ourselves from knowing what's going on in our own subconscious mind. And if, if we don't want to know what's in our own mind, uh, the idea that other people might be able to uh, see inside of us is, it must be truly horrifying. That's a very good observation, really. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> when you talk about telepathy, let's say I have some unconscious thought and somehow it gets communicated to you. One of the aspects of that that Freud touched upon but then seemed to be afraid to explore is that perhaps I can actually influence you in the process of communicating my thoughts. If you have a dream that corresponds to something that happens in my life, uh, perhaps I'm influencing you subsequently. Uh, that is, there's something a little chilling about that. <laughs> or possibly chilling. So even though Freud touched upon it, he didn't fully explore it. Uh, it's Eisenbach who, who did try to explore that. Uh, after all, if, if you have a Polaroid film and, and, and suddenly an image appears, Ted Serios creates an image on that film, that suggests that there's a t something telekinetic is going on. Why is it then not possible for something telekinetic to, to appear be, between Ted Serios and you or me uh, in the same way in which he influences something in my body. That's a very frightening thought. Again, as I say, the, the Ted Serios work, which I happen to think has been been ignored by parapsychologists as well, uh, is, 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 is very troubling, the fact that there may be uh, such abilities. I relationship that a, a psychoanalyst has with a client or a patient is very intimate at, at the uh, level of uh, the soul of psychology, even though it's not a physically intimate relationship, at least in principle. It seems as if it, it's a kind of relationship that would uh, lend itself to all sorts of telepathic exchanges between the two. Certainly, that's my experience, both as a patient of Eisenberg and as a psychoanalyst who sees patients. 
And, and the question often is how to introduce those relationships, uh, how to introduce with the patient in a therapeutic way the fact that something telepathic may have occurred between the patient and the therapist, and the, or the patient uh, may have picked up something in the therapist's life, or may, may even have picked up, sometimes in a competitive way, something with another patient whom that particular patient may not even know about, uh, uh, but may unconsciously have, have somehow managed to communicate with. So sometimes you can get dreams from patients that are seem to connect with each other. Having said all that, most analysts would, would not see as important or would not even see those kind of connections. Now, I gather from some of your writing that you sort of consider Jungians within the psychoanalytic family. Uh, although Freud and Jung had, had a very famous breakup, and I think uh, one of the things that triggered it was uh, a famous event in which Jung seemed to be able to know that there was going to be a, a loud crack in the uh, cabinet. Uh, where, where the two of them, there was one crack and, and they were startled and Jung somehow felt, I think, physiologically another crack was coming and he told Freud and uh, then it happened. And uh, it, uh, that event seemed to create a rift between the two of them as if Freud himself was uh, shocked or overwhelmed by Jung's uncanny uh, either telekinesis or prediction. I'm very impressed, Jeff, that you remember so well that particular event. You're absolutely right. That's the event that that occurred very famously. Jung and Ferenczi, another psych uh, famous psychoanalyst, and Freud himself, actually early on, particularly Jung, were very interested in in, in parapsychological phenomena. Jung, perhaps more so than 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 Freud. But that's one of the things that actually brought them together which people don't, again, psychoanalysts don't quite know this. That event that you mentioned was kind of the penultimate uh, aspect of the break between the, uh, be, 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 between the two. Jung had some theories which, frankly, I don't think he expanded upon as much as, as, as Freud did, did Freud's own theories. Jung had some theories about a, a collective unconscious where people uh, kind of communicated with each, each other generally. Um, often in, in terms of historical co collective unconscious, like history, they brought history with them. He had the idea of synchronicity, uh, which he brought up in some of his uh, books. But even though th that's an appealing name, I don't think it, 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 synchronicity, I don't think it really adds to, to parapsychological understanding other than to say they're, they're telepath, telepathic communications. Or, or psychokinetic communications in some way. Uh, I, I don't think Jung really did as much work in parapsychology as Freud did, but, I, but I'm not too sure that Freudians would agree with me. Well, you know, the reason I brought it up is because many years ago, I had occasion to have a conversation with James Hillman, a very prominent Jungian, and, and I brought up this question of, you know, Jung's interest in parapsychology, and he out and out denied it. And I thought, if, if a Jungian is going to deny uh, parapsychology, of course the Freudians will. I can't believe he denied it. That, that, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I think that's simply inaccurate. It's just uh, it's just inaccurate, and, and I, I think you were right to bring it up. But <laughs> I'm not too sure. I, I'm not too sure Jungians in general, the followers of Jung, would would would, would do what Hillman did. I, I think they might agree with it. They sometimes have come to conferences that I I've held that have to do with parapsychology. So. Uh, Jungians and, and Freudians, it's a large community. And uh, in, in your own writing, I see there were probably a good dozen Freudians who have contributed to the parapsychology literature. There absolutely are. George Devereux put together a famous collection of the writings of Freudians at that time. Uh, I think it was the late 40s, it may have been the 50s. If anybody is interested in getting into 
psychoanalysis and parapsychology. That's 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 the place that you start. Psychoanalysis and the occult. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, and that is a wonderful coll collection of 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 the writing at the time, which I don't think has been much improved upon since, except some of the work of uh, Eisenberg and, and Ehrenwald and Ullman. I think that, that that has been the best work. There are current psychoanalysts, younger psychoanalysts, who have touched on this field, who uh, often are in a field of psychoanalysis called relational psychoanalysis, and some some of them like to make a distinction between the old Freudians and themselves, but the actual material they're working with from a parapsychological viewpoint is exactly the same. Another interesting thing I discovered in, in your writing is uh, the relationship of uh, psychoanalysis and, and the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, who, who seemed to uh, strongly argue in favor of parapsychology. He really picked up on Freud's ambivalence about uh, about uh, uh, parapsychology. It, it's an intuitive understanding of what Freud was was struggling with. Freud sometimes said yes to yes to parapsychology. Sometimes said no to parapsychology. Some of his uh, followers, such as Jones, were appalled at the fact that he would he might touch on parapsychology. Uh, because they thought it would uh, not be to the benefit of psychoanalysis, which was trying to get a foothold in in the in the uh, psychological world, and others of his followers, like Ferenczi, whom I mentioned, were very much in favor of Freud's work in parapsychology. But Freud would oscillate both ways. Uh, nonetheless, the principles that Freud enunciated when he was Entertaining the idea of psi in psychoanalysis uh, remain to this day important and have not really been been challenged. Uh, you report a famous episode in which Freud had some correspondence with a well-known British psychical researcher, her word Carrington, and Freud wrote to him in a letter saying, if I could start my career all over again, I would choose to go into parapsychology. Then later, Freud denied it. You see the power of the unconscious? Freud did deny it later, and the letter had to be discovered, I guess, by, by a parapsychologist, a, a psychoanalyst by the name of Nandor Fodor, who, who discovered the letter and showed it to Freud, or was shown to Freud, and, and it, 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 he had to admit that, yes, he had written that. He said that if he had to do it over again, he would become a parapsychologist in, in effect. Of course, the unconscious, uh, <laughs> that you mentioned denial. <laughs> this is Freud's denial of his own interests. <laughs> That's one of the most powerful ideas that came out of Freudian theory, and I think uh, well uh, beyond the field of psychoanalysis itself, Freud had a huge cultural impact by pointing out to people that uh, we don't know what's going on in our own subconscious mind. We're being driven by forces we don't even recognize. In working with patients, that's one of the most important things that, that you help somebody to discover. I'm actually thinking of a patient uh, just yesterday who who was talking about just what you were, uh, just what you, you you articulated, and and to him that was an amazing recognition and the power of the unconscious, as he was saying, as my patient was saying, just the way you were saying it is really very very great, and and of course denial is the way in which we often deal with it. Eisenbud, uh, as I recall, pointed out that people who have psychic gifts, if they have these unconscious drives of which they're unaware, the psychic gift might function in the service of, of one of these drives or complexes. And if it's a self-destructive complex, a guilt complex, uh, it can be very detrimental to the person. I think one of Freud's statements, and certainly Eisenbud's, was that all of us are frequently having psi experiences. We may not recognize them as such, but they are part of everyday life. And, and Freud made that statement that if, para, if, psi, if psi exists, it must exist generally for everybody, and it must exist in everyday life, which is one of the points I try to make in my book. On the other hand, there are some people 
just like in any kind of uh, ability, who are exceptional, who who really have a, 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 the kind of psychic gift that Serios had, that can be very, very troubling to them. They don't quite know what to do with it. In, in our society, and I suppose they can sometimes be self-destructive too, let me just tell a quick anecdote. Serios, who had this wonderful ability, uh, thought thought maybe he was going crazy. He 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 went to a to a to a psychiatrist who convinced him that he must. Uh, this must have been a delusion of his his ability to create images on on pa- a Polaroid film. At which point, Serios went back. Threw out all his, threw out all the Polaroids, and 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 figured he, he, he now he was okay. He no longer had this psychic ability. Of course, the ability came back, uh, but it g- gives an indication of how somebody who has that ability gets can can get very confused and upset. And I also know of other people, who, including a patient of mine who who acted for a while as a psychic. Who, who have really struggled of how to put that uh, put that ability together uh, in terms of normal functioning. M- the the point I was going to make in reference to the Navajos and 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 and, Ho- and Indians in general is in our culture, when somebody has psychic ability, there is no place for them to develop it comfortably generally because it's looked upon as strange, maybe psychotic. Uh, uh, there's no, but but in 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 a Native American culture, if somebody has psychic ability, it's it's nurtured, it's accepted, it's understood, and the person feels as if it's more normal. Uh, that, that's the difficulty of Western culture, where psychic ability is not generally accepted, and and it can lead to exactly what you're talking about. It's very interesting that earlier we were discussing how in the context of a a psychotherapeutic relationship, telepathy between the analyst and the client is, is sort of normal. And yet at the same time, analysts want to deny even the possibility of that. They definitely want to deny it. It, it. it is very strange because, as you mentioned, the relationship between an analyst who sees a patient four times a week, three times a week, right now sees them not in person, but <laughs> but by doing a, uh, sees them through through the computer, and over many many years. I mean, this is not a, a treatment that lasts for a year or two. It often lasts for eight years. More than, or, or more, uh, four, three or four times a week, uh, there is an intimate, an intimacy, as you say, between. It's inevitable uh, that that there are going to be times when the patient will pick up something in my life, uh, it's, it, it, or, or a dream that I had. It's inevitable. How I introduce it is is something else. Uh, Eisenbud tended to introduce it. Uh, on the grounds that that it would help the patient to under, understand uh, his unco- his or her unconscious process, and that it was a key to understanding it. Uh, my experience of being an analysis with Eisenbud is this is just my particular take is that he was a little too involved in trying to prove the parasite the parapsychology of it, and it distracted sometimes from the very intimacy that exists. Uh, I have not figured out exactly how to handle it when a patient suddenly comes up with something that, that happened in, in my life. Sometimes I have introduced it. Uh, it depends on the patient. It depends on when in the therapy it's taking place. Uh, it depends on whether or not I think the patient can handle it. Uh, so I have not quite, I don't have a, a, a general way of how to proceed. I, I indicate that in the book that I, I, I wrote, uh, The Paranormal Surrounds Us, that, that sometimes I don't introduce, uh, what, what I see as, as a parapsychological connection. Sometimes I do. Sometimes they can be very important, just like, as when you talk with somebody, and sometimes it's something deep, and it, but it doesn't have to be some some something deep. It can be something trivial. My family uh, 
you used to go to Nyack because they had a wonderful Halloween parade, and every uh, members of our family would 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 get get dressed up, and um, uh, two members of the family, uh, extended family, got dressed up as as the Osbournes. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne and his wife Sharon. Uh, I dressed up as something else, but 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 the Ozzy Osbourne figure was so convincing that he and she won the contest as the best best figures in, in, in the parade and all that. And, and everybody would come up to him and take pictures of him and yell, hey, Ozzy, and everything. Okay, very similar. Thing. What does my patient dream of? She dreams, that she, she dreams of Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> very simple things. That patient, I could say, that patient who had been saying, you know, I'm curious about you, I'd like to know about your life, and, this, and had been saying it, and then comes in with this dream. That patient, I could say, and also in a humorous way, I could bring it up, and that patient happened to be able to accept it as a connection. It's not profound, but it is a wish to get to have a certain closeness to the analyst. And those things happen frequently in, in, in analysis. One of the most mysterious aspects of psychoanalysis that uh, and one of the most prominent at the same time is the whole question of transference uh, in the therapeutic process. And uh, I know you've written about the relationship between transference and psi between the analyst and patient. Transference is is the concept that a patient, a client, as you say, will see you as as somebody in his or her past will see you in some way as a mother or a father or a brother or even an important figure uh, in, in the past and will relate to you in that way. And it permits, it, it does have the virtue of then in the analysis of trying, of the, helping the patient to work through that relationship. Because of course, you're not the mother or father and you can give a different reaction uh, and, and help the patient see that the patient has a tendency to see people in, in some unconscious way as a mother or father relate to situations as, as the patient did when the patient was younger to a mother or, 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 or father. And sometimes, of course, the patient will dream of you, but will put you into a, a situation in which you're, you're acting like the father or the, lo or, or the mother or, or a lover or, or something. Like. And, and, and you can pr pr proceed in the psychoanalytic work, help the patient to recognize both the parapsychological connection uh, and also uh, how it's working through in the transference. Uh, so yes, yes, that, that happens frequently. It also has another aspect to it, which, which uh, there's a, a flip side to it, which of course, there tends there is often a counter transference called, from the analyst to the patient, which the analyst has to figure out him or herself, where the analyst is is thinking of the patient as a figure in his or her life. So it gets very complicated. Yes, it does. <laughs> but incidentally, it's wonderful work, and 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 Jeff, it's it's a pleasure that you're that you're asking these questions because they really go to the heart of the kind of work that 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 I do. Uh, and and you're asking them in such such an organized fashion in the way I, I'm, I'm much less organized than you. So this is it helps me to think think things through. Well, I'm thinking of um, I used to know, and you probably also used to know Berthold Schwartz, who was a, a, a psychiatrist who wrote a wonderful book on uh, telepathy between parents and children. And uh, he pointed out many people have observed that when you have a strong emotional bond, that is conducive to telepathy. I, I did not know Bertolt Schwartz. Uh, he did know Eisenberg. That I that I know. Uh, I, I never I've never spoken. He wrote a wonderful book called Parent Child Telepathy, which just uh, showed in the daily interaction between parents and children that uh, at least the way he that telepathy took place. And, and one would think that parents would, would recognize that. And, and despite that, it's hard to communicate sometimes that that, that, that exists. 
I just saw some research uh, recently. It had to do with out of body experiences, but which I think are somewhat relevant. And and the uh, researcher in the Netherlands surveyed 170 people who reported having had an out of body experience, and they noted that many of them thought it was a wonderful experience, uh, but many of them were frightened by it, and and they tried to break down what are the psychological differences between the people who love the experience and people who fear it. And it had to do, I think, to some extent with ego strength, that people who uh, felt that their ego was dissolving and they didn't couldn't handle it uh, got frightened. And I should think that often occurs simply uh, in the context of a telepathic experience as well. Certainly people have very different reactions to telepathic experiences, the possibility of tele telepathic experiences. And, and some of them are very, very frightened. Some are not. I would guess that you and I are, are less likely to be frightened. Uh, I, I'm not so sure it has to do with ego strength, uh, but I, I think sometimes it does have to do with e ego strength. But I, I, I'd, be, I, I'd be a little, uh, I wouldn't want to say that the people who are strong recognize parapsychological functioning and people who 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 are, who are weak don't i do i do think sometimes that that is a problem yes uh, in terms of ego strength for example i don't know why i have responded so much to this field uh it it it, it isn't as if eisenbach had to work very hard to convince me uh of of parapsychological functioning i seem to be at that time, even though I knew nothing about it, ready, very much ready to, to accept it. And it became my experience with, I, I had no experience with, with, uh, uh, parapsychology at all prior to my analysis with Eisenberg. Uh, I, it, it, I just took off. It just, it just, it, it just suddenly made perfect sense to me. But, but other people have very different reactions and, uh, uh the denial of, Psi functioning is is can be quite quite strong with people who who in other in, in other terms do have ego seem to have ego strength but seem appalled at the idea that there might be uh, a psi might exist and get very scared at the idea. Uh, look, it, 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 there has not been much success in the scientific community. Parapsychology has not had much success at all. Uh, despite the the vast amount of work that that has been done, but despite Eisenbud's work, despite the work of all all the parapsychologists, uh, it's just not not accepted. Uh, mm -hmm. just, despite Ryan's work, uh, it's it's just it, it just doesn't get much traction in in the scientific community. You would you would think it would, but it does not. I wonder if in your case, your experience on the Navajo and Hopi reservations opened you up maybe more than you appreciated at the time. As I recall, you did uh, publish a very exciting paper about uh, a form of divination called hand trembling. What I witnessed on the reservation was a, a, a kind of general belief, and, and, and this is very amorphous kind of, a general belief that people could communicate uh, psychically, uh, a, a whole culture which just simply accepted that, that that existed. There were not specifics that really that I can think of. I did not I did not wit witness hand trembling. I wrote about it, the, the Navajo hand trembler, and I think I w wrote about it because how much I had been impressed by by the general feeling of the culture. I wrote about the Navajo hand trembler. I, I, I think I wrote another paper that had to do with Native American acceptance of psi. Western culture seems to it, it seems to deny psi, and other cultures, which we call "quote unquote" primitive, uh, seem to have a better understanding of psychic connections between people. I, I found my experience on the Navajo reservation. Just, just fascinating. It's an interesting way to get into this study of parapsychology. Not everybody has the experience of living and working with with Native Americans. I, I did it not only on the reservation. I also did some. I was a lawyer at the time. I did some work uh, in in Denver with Native Americans 
I, I just found the difference in the cultures just just fascinating to me. Uh, and that's why I, that's also why I, I wrote about it. You also published, I think, at least a dozen examples of uh, telepathy that you experienced with your patients in the psychoanalytic context. Yes, that, that frequently happens. Sometimes I can use it in the way that Eisenberg tried to do to help the patient to understand what is going on with the patient and why psi might be invoked by the patient unconsciously. It was much more part of my work years ago. I don't know if I use it quite as much now. Sometimes patients can find out things in, in your life uh, and uh, because the patient wants a certain closeness uh, to you. I just consider it now a regular part of, of analysis that, that happens because if when you, it, it particularly happens if you're dealing with a patient three or four times a week, you're seeing, a, you know, uh, the patient is, it happens when the patient tells you his or her dreams uh, and you find out that his or her dreams may correspond to something that you dream. Uh, it's a frequent interaction. It depends on where the patient is at, whether or not the patient can can accept it. Some patients accept it readily, <clears throat> other patients uh, don't and, 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 and have difficulty with it. Now, you're a, I think the term would be a training analyst. You train other psychoanalysts, and I presume in the, in the process of training them, you engage in a psychotherapeutic relationship with them. Uh, so, the issue must come up, uh, is it appropriate in the training context to uh, discuss telepathy? Well, there, there are two ways in which I, I I deal with people who are psychoanalysts. One is I become their psychoanalyst. So there are a number of people whom I have in psychoanalysts who are studying to become psychoanalysts, and uh, at particularly at my institute, although there's sometimes people from other institutes who I also, and I, I treat them part of, to become a psychoanalyst, part of the treatment is you enter your own psychoanalysis. Uh, that's essential part of, part of the treatment. At other times, I am also a training analyst in, in that the person is him or her is becoming a psychoanalyst as part of their training. They are treating somebody and they come to me as the supervising uh, psychoanalyst, and they tell me about their treatment of the patient, and we discuss what, what, what's happening with the patient. So in two different ways, I interact with people who are becoming uh, psychoanalysts. With the people who are coming to me for their own therapy, their own psychoanalysis, I do discuss psi. With the other people, it's less frequent. Uh, it may not come up quite as frequently. The people who are using me as their training analyst uh, uh, in terms of their own work with some someone, but it comes up there as well. Whether or not I whether or not I make them devoted to parapsychology and psychoanalysis may depend on the person uh, and, and the circumstances. It has the possibility of perpetuating the study of parapsychology and psychoanalysis. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's, it's unlikely to occur, except people like, like me or other, other people who have an interest in parapsychology. It's a very small uh, group of people who are doing this kind of work, very, very small. And I would guess, frankly, it's smaller than it was uh, back in the days of Eisenberg and, 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 and uh, people in the past, uh, Eisenbad and Ullman and, and other people who were, who, 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 uh, I, I think the, the, uh, community of psychoanalysts who are parapsychologists, I think is, has actually dwindled, but I, I might be wrong about that. Well, I am under the impression that uh, with regard to the field of psychotherapy in general, the, the main driver are the insurance companies who are looking for short-term results. So, all the long-term therapies have, have suffered as a result of that. There's truth in that. It used to be that you could, uh, you could get full insurance for 
uh, for for going to somebody three or four times a week, uh, it, it's no longer as it's quite so easy. And you're quite right; it's 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 made it more difficult to explore this aspect of of functioning between between with in people and with, between people. Uh, it, it is harder. Uh, I, I've been very fortunate because I've continued to practice here. I I I, I live and work in in a suburb of New York City. And I and and I go into New York City for my inst- my institute, and I've been able to continue to practice three or four times a week with with, uh, with patients. But it's it's hard to do. I would imagine that you're limited to seeing patients who can afford uh, to come without the benefit of insurance. Sometimes insurance will pay. But less so, less frequently than it did before, and it does tend to limit you. But of course, if you're, it, it, I think if you're beginning as an as a therapist, it's harder. At, at this stage, I, I will take somebody at a reduced fee just for the pleasure of seeing them three or four times a week. But you're right; it, it, it's 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 harder these days to do the kind of psychoanalytic work that somebody like Eisenberg uh, did many years ago. Well, Richard Reichbart, this has been a fascinating conversation. Psychoanalysis is certainly an important window into the human psyche. And to be able to combine your your interest in uh, psychotherapy with your interest in parapsychology uh, makes you, in my eyes, a, a very important person uh, exploring the, the depths of the human soul. So I want to thank you very much for being with me. Jeff, thank you so much. I enjoyed this interview very much. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.